Hi, this is Estelle Erasmus, your host for Freelance Writing Direct. In this short, soundbite-filled podcast, I'll cover everything the freelance and creative writer and author needs to do to move forward with their writing, their creativity, and their career. Through conversations with guests, we'll cover tips, tricks and actionable strategies. So join me every week and grow your business and build your craft with Freelance Writing Direct. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. Welcome everybody to this episode of Freelance Writing Direct. I'm your host, Estelle Erasmus, and I'm so happy to have Amy Jones with us today. And let me tell you about Amy. I've worked with her for many years. She's the editor-in-chief of Writer's Digest and the former managing content director for Writer's Digest Books. She's the editor of the novel and short story writers market and the children's writers and illustrators market. Prior to joining the Writer's Digest team, she was the managing editor for Northlight Books and Impact Books. She also spent time producing instructional videos for Artist Network TV. Like most Writer's Digest staffers, Amy is a voracious reader and has a particular interest in literary fiction, historical fiction, page-turning mysteries, and steamy romance. She volunteers for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and at Ohio Alley cat resource, her local no-kill cat shelter. And you can find her on Twitter and Instagram at Amy M. Jones with an underscore five. And I'm going to share that in the show notes. Welcome, Amy. I'm so happy to have you speaking with me today. Hi, Estelle. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, Amy, I mean, Writer's Digest is a niche publication that is also in print. And there have been so many changes in the industry. Back when I started three decades ago, there were so many publications that were more general interest that were in print. And now it's really just niche publications. And those are thriving. So can you tell me a little bit about the genesis of Writer's Digest, because it's a venerable publication that has quite a lot of decades behind it. <laughs> it does. We're going into, I think, our 104th year coming up in 2024. So it, it started over 100 years ago by a company called F&W Publications at the time, and it was Farmers and Writers. So they had magazines about farming and magazines about writing. And I am not entirely sure why they thought those two things went together. (laughs) I think there is a story behind it, but I no longer know what that story is. But the the farming magazines have sort of gone by the wayside. FNW Publications has gone by the wayside. But somehow Writer's Digest has managed to survive a couple of world wars or a a world war, I should say, pandemics, market Mm -hmm. crashes. So somehow we've managed to hang on. And I think that's because we're always going to need writers, even as AI kind of takes over, (laughs) it becomes more ubiquitous. I think we're we're still going to need writers. So I think we'll still be around for, for a long time. And the print issue, which I've had the honor and pleasure of writing for, is six times a year at this point, right? And and, and then you said that at some point you're doing special interest issues as well, or is that a new initiative? Yeah, so we were, initially the magazine was 12 issues a year, and over time it's gradually gone down to six, but we've expanded the issue. So now it's a bigger issue with more content instead of several smaller issues which I prefer because I think we get to cover topics more in depth. When we choose our themes, we're really able to cover it in a variety of different ways instead of just a handful the way it was when there were 12 issues. But then with the special interest publication, we hadn't had one for years for a variety of reasons. And we brought it back last year and it did really well. So we're in the middle of of closing that one right now, actually. And it will be out in the winter. 
Okay, great. And so, and you also have online digital. So the digital arm oh, yes. well, which mm-hmm. regularly shares articles by writers. And can you talk a little bit about that aspect as well? Yeah, the the online, the website just has so much information. I can barely keep up with it. We have two editors dedicated just to our website. I mean, they do, they do other things, but they there are two of us who focus more heavily on the magazine and two of us who focus more heavily on the website content. And it covers everything from all types of writing fiction, all types of writing nonfiction, and every part of the publishing business that you could think of, finding agents, common publishing terms, self-publishing or indie publishing, a whole section about that. So yeah, our our online content is robust, I will say. (laughs) Absolutely. And I recently actually had a piece talking about maximizing book launch week, and I Mm. have some others that are coming out as well as in print. So I was also the columnist for All About the Pitch for two years, and I loved writing that and interviewing editors and breaking it down. So Writer's Digest is really for the writer who wants to write in every aspect of the writing world, right? So it's books, it's articles, it's literary, it's short pieces, like you said, looking for an agent. Yeah, we try to, this is another reason why I love that the magazine has gone from more issues to fewer issues, but expanded the page count, because now we're able to make sure that every issue has something for every kind of writer all the time. So there's always going to be a poetry article. There's always going to be an article about some aspect of writing nonfiction. Um, There's always going to be an article that includes something about the creative life or the writer's life. There's always going to be something about finding an agent and children's writing. I cannot neglect children's writing. We always have a column about children's writing in there, which we call for all ages because we believe that children's writing is not just for children. (laughs) It is for all ages. Um, That's something we genuinely believe. We all, I know I really enjoy middle grade fiction these days. I've read some really great ones. So yeah, we, we try to make sure that every writer has something in every issue that will resonate with them or help them in some way. Yeah, that's what I love because it really aligns with my mission of helping writers and supporting them. And Writer's Digest gives this enormous support through tools and tips and actionable strategies and advice from people doing in the field, Mm -hmm. writing the books. And even I love that you focus on debut authors as well. Oh, yeah. Because that is something that's so informative and helpful for readers to see how somebody is navigating that rocky Mm -hmm. terrain, especially in the beginning. Everyone starts from a beginning place. So I think that's really so useful and helpful. And I don't see it in any other place besides Writer's Digest. So that's Mm -hmm. great. So let's talk about some of the highlights, I mean, you have spoken with and interviewed so many writers from, I can't, like Chuck Wendig and just so many for the different conferences and also the pages mm-hmm. of the magazine. Who are some of your highlights and, and why? <laughs> well, I think my, my biggest highlight was interviewing Ian McEwen for the November, December 2022 issue, I think it was last year. Um, I have studied Ian McEwen's work since my undergrad days, and I spent most of my graduate work studying his writing and, you know, seeing how it spoke to other writers that I admired, like Virginia Woolf. So I, getting to interview him was, was a bucket list moment for me. He was so nice. I mean, I've, I've, this is going to sound creepy, but I've traveled to see him speak in person when he comes to the United States for his book launches. So that was special for me. And then here's a little secret. I just interviewed Michael Cunningham. He is going to be the cover interview for our January, February, 2024 issue for his new novel day. And I was able to tell him this, and this is something that we all 
believe a writer's digest when you get the opportunity to thank somebody for having an impact on your life especially a writer it's great to be able to do that so for me when i read michael cunningham's novel the hours when i was in high school it, it came out that book sort of changed the trajectory of my life i did not realize that publishing and reading for a living was something that was a viable career option <laughs> <laughs> until I read that book and was introduced to Virginia Woolf and learned about her printing press and that there are editors and these things still, you know, they aren't just something of the 1920s, they still exist. I hadn't considered when I was in high school how books got made, but reading that book and being introduced to Virginia Woolf by Michael Cunningham, that really changed the trajectory of my life. So being able to interview him was also a bucket list moment for me. That's fabulous. So you really run the gamut from literary fiction to more pop culture fiction. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody pop culture that you interviewed besides Chuck? I mean, you could talk about Yeah, Chuck. two of my favorite like genre writers. I loved being able to interview Beverly Jenkins and Jasmine Guillory. I love romance books. <laughs> they They are my escape when I get overwhelmed with with work or speak a conference planning all of that that romance novels are sort of my my escape so being able to talk to them about how they create the feelings and the connections that are in the, their romance novels was was particularly special for me i i think romance writers are some of the best at capturing emotions and the way people connect and those feelings that sort of get you in the stomach when you when you find the person that you are meant to be with for at least that period of time. So yeah, I really appreciate being able to talk to, like you said, the whole gamut of writers. And, and so like for Beverly, for example, did she give you a, a tip, you know, in terms of how she evokes that emotion, what she does? You know, she's, if I recall, she talked about it really coming, um, the characters, but I, what I got from her more was so many of her books feature or are inspired by people who existed after the Civil War Reconstruction. Yeah. They're inspired by people who lived during that time and found success during that time, but have sort of been lost to history. So in the back of her book, she has these um, nice addendums of all of the history books and the memoirs and the diaries and the first person resources that she found and used to create these historical romances, which is, you know, when I first went into them, not what I expected because most romance novels don't have a list of <laughs> the historical texts that they have used to create the stories, what? but she makes them come alive. And that's, that's what I, appreciate I, from her writing. I love that you're saying that, Amy, because it's she's applying a journalistic tool mm -hmm. by doing that, doing the deep dive research and sharing her ephemera and the resources. And I mm -hmm. think that's great. And I would love it if writers did that more because it really it's helpful to imbue journalism mm -hmm. to that kind of writing to show that you have the credibility. And, the right. emotion. and I think that's very impactful, along with the emotional mm -hmm. implication of everything that she's writing. Yeah, well, and she comes from a librarian's background. She worked in libraries for many, many years before she um, became a published novelist. So wow. I think that, I mean, that's another sweet spot for me is appreciation for your public library. In writing that gets noticed, I have a section, I say librarians mm -hmm. are heroes because Absolutely. they have so many resources, but there are just so many resources and websites and things that people cannot access if they mm -hmm. don't have access to a librarian and what they can bring to the table. So oh, yeah. I'm so glad actually that we're talking about it and that it is a sweet spot of yours. Mm -hmm. So was there anything surprising in these interviews that some that anybody has said to you that you just thought, wow, this is really wild? So I interviewed Lisa Jewell, the British mystery thriller novelist. Uh, I think it maybe at this point it was a year and a half or two years ago, but there's something she said like, 
has stuck in my mind. And every time I read one of her books, I can't get it out of my mind because she said when she sits down to write, she has no plan. She doesn't plot her books out at all. She just writes until she gets to the end of a chapter and then picks up the next chapter wherever she thinks it needs to go, whatever character. And she has no idea where her books always have such great twists in them and they are never predictable. She has so many, I can't remember what it was, what it was called, but it literally just came out in the summer of when we're recording this 2023. And I had no idea where it was going, but the twist was perfect. And having talked to her and knowing that she did not know where it was going from the beginning, all of the clues were just, if you went back, they were there. They were in there, but it didn't feel like they were planted or contrived, even though she must have had to go back and add some of them in. But her books always feel like they have. I don't mean this in a negative way. They feel like planning went into them because they're so smart and the twist is never predictable. But she has no plan for them when she plots them. And I had to, she said it was a product of having written so many novels and doing this for so many years that over time she has stopped needing to plan them out. I love that. It's sort of mm -hmm. like the, what Malcolm Gladwell says, you know, the 10,000 hours. So yes. she's put in those hours and now exactly. she can just really kind of play with the with the rules. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting because, as you know, I'm working on a novel now. And I've been reading other people's works with mm -hmm. post-its in my hand. And every time I see a twist in somebody's book, like an early Easter egg, and I think it's going to be important, I put a little post-it because it's helping me in my writing because I'm not outlining it out. So it's like kind of the characters are telling me what they want to tell me when the day that mm -hmm. when I'm writing it. And I find I'm learning so much that way because I'm imbuing the work of others and how they have plotted out. Obviously, they figured it out. And I'm thinking as I write, oh, well, maybe this should be an Easter egg. And so I'm highlighting mm -hmm. possible turn, possible indication, even to the point, and I think it was someone at the Writers' Digest Conference where I spoke on two different sessions about nonfiction writing, but somebody said that each chapter should have these little twists, mini twists and turns that just build to something. So maybe you're building mm -hmm. the conflict but it's not like the strong conflict that's going to be much later. It just keeps right. getting incrementally built. So that's fascinating. And I love that she told it to you in that very specific way. Anything else? This is great. <laughs> oh, for the 2022 Writer's Digest Annual Conference, I had the opportunity to interview Marlon James for the central keynote. And one of the things that stuck with me was he talked about it, just how many rejections he got when he was querying. And, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was, it was a lot. <laughs> and I feel like at one point he said he burned a manuscript because it was not getting traction. And then somehow shortly after that, he did get an acceptance and it set his career off. That is a theme that has kind of stuck through all of the interviews that I've done, the persistence that all of these writers have had in order to find the, the level of success that they've had. You know, there are, they get so many rejections and you have to have thick skin when you're querying or when you're on submission, because if you give up, I mean, that's a surefire way never to never find success. But if your goal is traditional publishing and getting an agent, being willing to put up with the rejection to get to the point of that acceptance that you need is is key. That's something literally, I mean, Marlon James, Chris Bajalian, I, I could name so many others who that's that's their story. I'm so glad you're saying that because people have to realize that publishing is a long game. Oh, yeah. And each experience that you're getting needs to build to this 
belief that you are improving your work, you're improving your game, mm -hmm. you're, you're getting better, and you're going to take all the resources around you and feed yourself with it, whether it's courses or or podcasts or other information or conferences. And that's just going to help you get better. And mm -hmm. each time you're going to elevate. I love the word elevate. I use it a lot. <laughs> And I think that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about elevating and building resilience and being mm -hmm. like, okay, I can keep doing this because you're right, Amy, the people who give up, who say, oh, I got like 10 rejections and now I, I'm just, I can't do it. They will never get anywhere. But the ones who keep mm -hmm. moving along, they say that, I think it's in a famous movie, but a shark has to keep moving forward it, or it will die. Well, it's this right thing with a writing career you have to keep moving forward and so it's a very important even though people can pick up tools and tips and tricks and strategies and information this mindset that you need to have is just so tantamount to the idea of the writing life mm -hmm. practice and ultimate success so I'm so yeah. glad that up well and I think I mean there's the persistence factor and, but I think writers also need to give themselves credit for putting themselves out there. You know, it, when you get the rejection, don't, it's going to be hard not to take it to heart. And I'll be very honest, I have not queried an agent at this point. My, my writing is not there yet, <laughs> but giving yourself credit for taking the bravery to send your writing to someone that you don't know. and yeah and get their feedback for it and be willing to, you know, potentially get that rejection or hopefully get the acceptance. Just giving yourself, I think, yeah, credit for your bravery and the grace you need in the face of the rejection to keep moving forward. Um, I actually love that alliteration, the grace in the face of rejection. <laughs> That's oh, <great>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's such an important sentiment to share. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So you also have a podcast, right? You've had a few yeah. episodes out. And mm -hmm. what do you love about doing your podcast? So our podcast kind of, they it shifted a little bit over time. We're in the middle, I think, of our second year doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I have loved about it, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love interviewing the authors and having the guests come and talk to us. But a lot of our episodes are the editorial team of Writer's Digest talking about a particular topic. And we all work in different places at the pandemic. When the pandemic started, we um, went remote. And at this point, we are not going back. So we've got someone in Georgia and another person in Maryland and a few of us in Ohio. So I have loved being able to have monthly conversations with the other editors about things that are not deadline related. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, we talk every day about the magazine articles that are coming in and planning for conferences or whatever, but being able to sit down and talk about, you know, a craft topic or books that we love or our hot takes on whatever publishing drama has happened this week <laughs> has really been something very special. And I have really, really enjoyed getting to know the other editors in that way. I equate it to like if you're in a marriage and your your day to day is like talking about what the kids are doing or what mm -hmm. you know, what's happening with other like day to day things, and then you once in a while go out for date night and you're talking about yeah. non you know work day to day work related or mm -hmm. family related topics. So that's like the the building the team building element yeah it's our virtual office space I guess yes. but more fun <laughs> everyone needs that and so talk to me about what your dream articles would be you know what kind of content are you looking for to fill the pages well, we we just put out our editorial calendar for 2024, so I am I'm very excited to see what kind of pitches we get for our themes. And one of the things that we make a note of on the editorial calendar of our on our website is we have an idea of what we think 
these themes might mean to writers and what we think the issue might turn out to be, but I love to be surprised. So I, there's one issue in particular I'm very excited about. It's going to be uh, inspired by nature. I have been reading a lot of climate fiction lately, but then writing about nature has been going on for centuries. So I'm very interested to see what kind of article pitches we get for that issue, because I'm sure what I'm thinking of is not going to be the same thing that, that other people are thinking of. So we encourage writers to think outside the box for the pitches, something beyond just, I don't know, we're doing, you know, some classic themes this year, like exploring conflict and emotion and I think there are some fairly obvious topics to do with with that, but I'm excited to see what is beyond what kind of things I haven't been thinking of that we might get. And then, of course, one of the things that I love and hate about the feature articles that come in is when they use examples from current current novels or you know current literature. It, it I hate it because it extends my reading list. <laughs> <laughs> so dramatically every time I end up going on a little shopping spree almost every issue because you know when you when writers are pointing out something that another writer has done really well yeah. which I we really focus on in our in our magazine is focusing on the positive what has something done particularly fantastically when you see that it's hard not to want to go and pick up that book and read it immediately <laughs> Yeah. So I, I always, I'm a sucker for articles that have examples from current literature. I like that. Is there a submission email that people should submit to? Yes, it is wdsubmissions at aimmedia.com. And AIM Media has two M's in there, A-I-M-M-E-D-I-A. Perfect. Can you tell me what the pay rate is, Amy, for print and digital? Sure. The pay rate for the magazine is 50 cents per word. And we assign the word count at the time um, that we assign the article because, you know, certain word counts fit on certain pages based on the layout. So feature articles are either 2,000 or 2,500 words. So we you know what you're going to make based on that assignment. For the website, it's a bit lower because we do so many articles on the website. So it's usually $50 for an article on the website, but that can, that might be negotiated. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Yeah. What are some actionable writing slash submitting tips and you said one which would be you like showing examples of what somebody has done in a novel mm -hmm. or a book what what are some others I will say we get a lot of pitches for personal essays or people wanting to get their short story or their poems published in the magazine and unfortunately that's just not the kind of magazine we are we are helping people learn to write, but we aren't the literary journal that's going to showcase the thing that you have written, <laughs> the thing that we have taught you how to write. So I wouldn't recommend submitting personal essays as even if it is, does relate to a craft topic, I would try to focus more on the instructional side of that. And that's not to say you cannot include stories related to your personal experience in the article, but overall, it should be an instructional article instead of, you know, a personal essay. I would also say we really like to keep our feature articles connected to the theme of the issue. If it's not, it's more likely that we would consider that topic for a column where it might fit in a column or to the inkwell section at the beginning where we sort of have free reign to include whatever we want. We've been doing some like travelogue type things where what a freelance writer, Zach Pettit, has showcased some writerly homes, like Ernest Hemingway's home with some beautiful photographs. So Inkwell is where we're able to play around a little bit and not stick to the theme quite so much. 
and then I will also say, and this is advice that I think is pretty common and everyone gives it and yet it's not followed that carefully is to check out recent issues because I cannot tell you how many times I have received a pitch for an article that is on the issue is in the issue that's on the newsstands right now or a pitch that is addressed to a person who hasn't worked here in several years I mean that's not going to be the end of the world addressing it to someone who used to work here but it's a courtesy to you know know who you're addressing and it will just save you time and energy if you take a look at a recent issue and not pitch something that is just been included. <laughs> yeah, writer writers should always look at the publication that they're interested in writing for. So yeah, absolutely. And where could writers get the submission guidelines? Are they available on the website? They are. There are two pages on the website. If you scroll down to the very, very bottom of the website, there's a footer and it says write for us. And that will have the submission guidelines for all of the different sections of the magazine and the typical word count for that section of the magazine. So you know, like what kind of space you're working with. And then built into that is a link to our editorial calendar. That's perfect. Thank you so much. This has yeah. been so great talking to you. I'm going to now segue to the a new segment that I've added, which okay. is what are you reading? What <laughs> and this is a question for you? What are you yes. listening to? And what are you buying? Okay. <laughs> I'm reading way too much, which is the best problem to have. It's what I wanted to do with my life, be able to read for a living. Right now I am reading The Hacienda by Isabel Canas. And it came out last year and I've been waiting for it, waiting to have time to read it. And I finally got to it and I have 30 pages left and it is killing me a little bit that I have to work today oh. <laughs> and I can't go and finish that book because it's just, it's a perfect gothic horror. I just, oh, it's, it's fantastic. It's her debut. And then I, a couple others that I recently read that I can't get out of my mind, Big Gay Wedding by Byron Lane. I wrote about that for a column in the November, December issue because I just loved it so much. I laughed and I cried and sometimes I laughed until I cried. <laughs> it was it was just perfect. It was heartwarming and charming and I just can't say enough good things about that book. And then one more, Escape to Florence by Kat Devereaux. I don't think it's gotten a lot of attention, but I love Italy. I love Florence in particular. And so I read almost any book that has Italy tangentially related, I will pick up and read. And this one, I read it right when I had just gotten back from a visit to Florence and it took me back. She captured the essence of Florence, I think very well. So if you're a fan of Still Life by Sarah Winman, which was also about Florence, I would pick up Escape to Florence by Kat Devereaux because it was it was really well done. As far as what I'm watching or listening to, I've been re-watching The Newsroom, Aaron Sorkin show with Jeff Daniels. Yes. Uh, I'm a big Aaron Sorkin fan. <laughs> I love The West Wing, um, right. the show I've watched the most often, but I am re-watching The Newsroom now. And it is taking me back to uh, major events of like 2014 and people that I had forgotten existed and wish I could keep on forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> I also have been watching Stanley Tucci's Instagram because I can't wait for his show Searching for Italy to come back. So Stanley Tucci's Instagram features him cooking and tasting wine. It's just a delight. You asked what I'm buying. Yeah. More books and lots of cat food. <laughs> 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 I mean, I know it's a cliche. I am the cliche of a cat person sitting there reading with a cat curled up next to me, but it's true. I have many of both. I'm obsessed on TikTok. I watch the animal, like the animal stuff. And there's one, I think his name is Jacob. He's cat daddy. And he has okay. this 
feral it was it's formerly feral now friend buddy do you know the saga of this i'll have to say no it. he has 18 cats including but yes yes it's all the stories about how the cats get along and like buddy this feral cat maybe has a romance with another cat lola it's just it's oh wow grossing <laughs> maybe i'll have to join tiktok just so i can watch those <laughs> I, you can go down a rabbit hole i mean yeah. there's group talk as well but a lot mm -hmm. of you know younger people but it's still it's very interesting although my daughter is not a fan of me being on tiktok okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's a teenager go figure yeah, well <laughs> so this has been so great talking to you where can people find you i know you talked about where you're on twitter you're on instagram yeah i i will say i am i'm really bad at social media i am a, a silent I'm a lurker, I guess. I like to sit there and scroll silently and maybe like some things here or there. But yeah. when something, you know, when something gets me really excited, I will I will tweet about it or post about it. But yeah, Twitter and Instagram are really the two places where I am. Although I need to, I think I signed up for threads. Yeah, I will say, I guess I, um, I prefer Instagram over Twitter these days, for sure. I like the positivity I and pictures on Instagram versus the visual and the whatever content. is happening on Twitter. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Follow me at EstelleSErasmus.com on my website and on social media, which is Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Estelle S. Erasmus. And we're now on YouTube for Freelance Writing Direct. Follow along and soon everyone will be reading what you're writing.